Hi, we're Matt and Carrie Tucker, and we lead an SE online group from Decatur, Illinois. Together in our group, we have people from all over the country. We love our SE online community. If you're not in a group, join a group today. You get to make new friends, be a part of a great community, and study the Word of God with people from everywhere. So y'all don't miss your opportunity to join an online group today. I love seeing our online groups. They are some of the best part of what we do. And y'all welcome to Southeast Online. We are so glad you're here. And just right away from the spark, I wanna let you know that Southeast Online groups are one of the best ways that you can find community like right now. And one of the things we love about that is what that video just showed you is that you get to meet with people from all different stages and ages of life, but also all sorts of locations. So if you're not a part of a Southeast Online group, today's your day, sign up. We got a lot of groups right now that have some space and they would love to have you sign up. You can text the word groups to 733-733 or for a direct link, just head down to the chat on whatever platform you're on and you can link up right away with a Southeast online group. Joining me right now before we get started today is our very own Sarah Rodriguez and she's hanging out Hi. backstage at our Blank and Baker campus hey, with some Steven. of the worship team. Good morning, everyone. How are you guys doing? We're doing so good back here. Um, so I think most people online, you're used to either seeing me on stage or just hosting with Steven out in the atrium. But today you get to be backstage with me. So this is my home away from home. This is where production and creative and worship teams meet together. Sometimes we have dinner together for service. If it's in the evening or breakfast in the morning, um, we just hang out and we pray. So right now we are gonna join the band for prayer. So would you pray with us? That group. Oh, really? That looks like band. God, thank you so much uh, for this family. Thank you for this team. And uh, God, we just thank you right now for what you did in our first service this morning. Uh, God, thank you for what you did on Thursday night. And God, we just know that you're moving in this place. And we just want to thank you in advance for what you're going to do in the second hour. And uh, God, we just pray uh, your spirit and your blessing over our people, over our room. And God, that today's worship would glorify you uh, with everything in us. God, that it wouldn't be about watching church, but it would be about participating and being the church. And whether in the room or whether online, we are, we get to be the church. So today, would you light a fire within your people uh, to worship you in spirit and in truth, but God, also to just hear from your word. So God, we want to open our hearts to you. God, would you uh, would you bless this service? God, would you be anointed? God, um, would this worship be pleasing to your heart, to your ear? God, we love your family. We love your people. And God, we can't wait to worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I know sometimes when we tune into these moments, we're always wondering what kind of church are we? We're this kind of church that prays, uh, prays for our community and uh, we care about you. And we just really want to let you know that if at any point during today's service, you're looking for a way to connect with Southeast, it's super easy to do that. Number one, you can just like join the chat. We've got a team of chat hosts that are awesome people that are there ready to connect with you. But you can also text the word connect uh, to 733-733 and someone like me is gonna follow up with you and look for all the ways that we can get you connected to Southeast because that is exactly what we wanna do do is connect with you. We've got a brand new sermon series, but we are in the same book of the Bible. We're in a sermon series that's going to be called Flip the Switch. Uh, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4, and I love it. Kyle's going to be talking about the turn that happens in the book of Ephesians in chapter 4, so you're going to want to tune into that because something happens right there where the tone of the book shifts. And so Kyle is going to be here with a great message that I promise this is a message for everyone, and he's going to be sharing some central truths to the gospel that are true for all of us that all of our hearts need to hear. So I want you to do a couple things right now. Just a few more seconds before service begins. I want you to open your heart and open your mind. I want you to get ready to worship together because this is more than a video, guys. This is this is more than just uh, this is more than just something you're watching. This is a community, and this is going to be something that really can speak to your heart and can change your life. So let's do that. Let's set our hearts and minds as we head into worship right now. Thanks for joining us. I'll see everyone after service. Now let's head into worship.
There's nothing to fear now For I say with you So when I fight I fight on my knees With my hands lifted up In order The battle belongs to you In every fear I lay at your feet And I sing through the night the battle belongs to the earth. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible.
Are you tired? It's a question we're used to getting asked, or at least answering ourselves. But today, I'm not talking so much about your eyes. I'm talking about your soul. Is your soul tired? If the answer to that question is yes, Jesus has a message for us. I'm gonna to read to you from Matthew chapter 11. It's a really famous verse. You've probably heard it before. If you've been coming to church, this is what he says. Chapter 11, verse 28 of Matthew, he says, come to me. All of you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens and I will give you rest. There's a promise in there, the promise of rest. But before we jump to the promise, I wanna make sure that we don't miss the beginning of the verse, those first three words. This is what Jesus says. He says, come to me. Now, why does he make it such a big deal to, to, to say that? Why not just say, I'll give you rest. He says, come to me, because I think Jesus is pointing out to his followers, there's a lot of people going to a lot of places in search of this thing called rest. And we do the same thing. The question that we have to wrestle with this morning between us and our heavenly father, between us and Jesus is, where do I go for rest? Because Jesus makes it clear. There's a lot of things you can go to. You can go to money, you can go to success, you can go to popularity, you can go to relationships. But he says, come to me. To be a follower of Jesus means that you set your sights on Jesus. And if those other things come, great. And if they don't, great, because you have the one thing that you need. Jesus and Jesus alone can give you the rest that you are looking for. Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens and I will give you rest, but he doesn't stop there. Next verse is a little confusing to me. I've heard this before and it's always confused me. Here's what he says after that. He says, so take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. If you don't know what a yoke is, it's something that they would put on the necks of oxen or donkeys that would then carry the load of something. And so Jesus has two messages here. He says, hey, if you come to me, I'll give you rest and I'm also gonna give you a yoke. That doesn't really make sense. Unless you really pay attention to his language. Whose yoke is he putting on you? His. And if his yoke is on you, then whose yoke is not on you? yours. And so today, as we get ready to take communion, we remember this truth that when you follow Jesus, when you put your faith and trust in him, you lose control of your own life and you take on what he wants for you. This is the beauty of the gospel, brothers and sisters, that Jesus doesn't just give you a yoke. Yes, he gives you a yoke. He gives you a mission for your life, but he also gives you a crown. Because when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you can then be connected to God again. It is only through Jesus that you can be connected to God. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you join the royal family, you get the crown, you, not because of anything you've done, all because of what he's done. But then as you wear that crown, as you're part of that royal family, the family of God, you have a role, you have a yoke, you have a mission, and that is to love others and serve others the same way that Jesus did. As we get ready to take communion, what we are praising, what we are worshiping, what we are thinking about this morning is that Jesus loved you and died for you so that you could be connected to God again. Our connection to God is because of Jesus and only Jesus. Do you need rest? Don't look for it anywhere else except Jesus. Let me pray for us and then we're gonna worship. God, thank you. Jesus, thank you. Holy Spirit, thank you. We need your rest. So would you speak to us in these next few moments? In Jesus' name, everyone said. takes it. 
it's told And when I fear I can't go on Though it feels like I'm alone There's a place I can go Before I build on sinking sand Trust in flesh alone May I seek your perfect wisdom There's a place I can go oh, I will run to your name I'll run to your name Jesus, my I'm a king who hears my cry
take on your peace. Your easy yoke, Lord, is so much better than anything else, Lord. It's better one day in your courts than a thousand anywhere else, Lord. And we believe that. And it's hard to believe that sometimes, Father, but we know you give us peace. You guide us with your Holy Spirit. You en enrapture us in your community. You love us more and more every day, Lord. And the more we draw close to you, the more you draw close to us. And I'm just thanking you for your power. I'm thanking you for your presence right now. I'm thanking you, Lord, for this time in this whirlwind of this world that we're in right now, Lord, it's so easy to get distracted and not be at peace, Lord, but I pray that we can have the power to take on your peace, that mysterious peace that you love and you want us to be in, Lord. I pray, Lord, that we can take it. It's in your precious son, Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen. Y'all can have a seat. So we are continuing in our study through Ephesians, the New Testament letter written to a church in the city of Ephesus. Um, but we're starting a new series within that study this weekend called Flip the Switch. And what I'm hoping will happen for us as we study some very practical scriptures over the next number of weeks is that every time you flip on a switch, whether it's at home or in the car or at the office, that it would be a trigger for you to stop and think about some of what we're studying together um, as we go through Ephesians. So Ephesians chapter four is where we're gonna be starting off. If you wanna go ahead and turn there in your Bibles, that would be perfect. Um, every once in a while, as a pastor, I'm asked to officiate a funeral of someone who maybe became a follower of Jesus later in life. And so you have this dynamic where you're remembering someone who spent most of their life outside of Christ, but they had you know, a number of years as a follower of Christ. And inevitably, you'll have people who were not a part of that time, right? So it's just this dual identity. It's like you're remembering two different people, and it can create some uncomfortable moments. Uh, a funeral that I'm thinking of is for this middle-aged man named Frank. He died unexpectedly. <laughs> He had become a follower of Jesus later in life, and that's how I knew Frank. He was just a very humble, faithful follower of Christ, a servant in the church, a wonderful husband and father, and yet he didn't spend most of his life with that identity. And so the family said for the funeral, they wanted to have an open mic where you just let anybody come up and share a favorite Frank story, favorite memory of Frank. I'm like, ah, I don't like that. I don't like open mics. Like, you never know what somebody's gonna say. I would argue that people don't know what they're gonna say, right? That's part of the problem. They get up and it's emotional and you never know what's, what's gonna come out of their mouths. And so like, no, we want an open mic. It's gonna be great. And I'm like, it, will it be though? And, and so we went back and forth and, and ultimately we're gonna do what they wanna do. And, and so we had the open mic and sure enough, right out of the gate, some buddies of Frank's from college came up. They'd flown in for the uh, funeral. And they had a few stories to share. And it got awkward quickly. They talked about the partying in college. One of the quotes I remember was, Frank was picky about his cars, but not his girls. Like, oh, come on, not at a funeral. And so I did what I'd been trained to do. I, I got up and I stood next to them, uncomfortably close to them as a way to let them know, your time's up, bye-bye, you're, you're finished. It's time for somebody else. If a pastor ever does that to you, that's what that means. It means you need to go <laughs> sit down. And so I stood up next to him, and they, they went and had a seat. And, and I was gonna speak into the situation and, and try to salvage it a bit and say, hey, here's the difference that Jesus made in Frank's life. But before I had a chance, his brother-in-law had popped up and he was a little annoyed with the whole thing. And uh, this is his wife's brother. And I'll never forget what he said. He looked at the college buddies and he said, hey, Frank died unexpectedly a few days ago, but the Frank that you described 
died a long time ago. And that's the difference of the gospel. The Bible says in Ephesians that there is a new life. The old is gone, the new has come. And when we become a follower of Jesus, when that becomes our identity that we're in Christ, it changes how we live. We're not the same as we used to be. It changes how we love, it changes how we talk, it changes how we give, it, it changes us. And so when someone is baptized, that's really what we're celebrating. We're celebrating a new identity, that the old is dead and buried. When someone's baptized, they're put under the water. That's like a watery grave, and they come up out of the water. It's a new life in Christ, a new identity that translates into new living. And if you have the identity, then you should have the, the life. That it, we're not who we used to be. And so we celebrate that when we gather together. That's what we want. We want our lives to reflect our new identity, but sometimes that's a challenge. And so that's what Paul is writing to these believers about in Ephesians. They've become followers of Christ. That's their identity. So how does that affect the way they live? So Ephesians chapter four begins with um, a conjunction. Kind of unusual to start a chapter with a con conjunction, but it starts with the word, therefore. Therefore. And this word is like the one word that the entire book swings on. It's like a hinge for the entire book of Ephesians, where chapters one through three is identity, this is who you are. Therefore, chapters four through six, this is how you live. One through three, you are loved and chosen. You are redeemed and forgiven, you are called. Therefore, chapters four through six, live like it. This is who you are, therefore this is how you should live. And so we're transitioning in this study into some really practical instructions for how we live, how we do life together, what our lives should look like based upon who we are in Christ. And so, so Paul is gonna give us some, some help to align our life with our identity. Chapter four, verse one, therefore I, prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. I beg you to lead a life worthy of your identity because you've been identified by God. And the word beg here is a word I wanna draw your attention to. NIV says implore. You hear the passion in that word? He's pleading with them, please. Listen, please don't say you're a follower of Jesus and then live in a way that is contrary to Jesus. Please, I beg, I beg you. I beg you, don't go around telling people you're a part of this church and then live in a way that is contrary to what this church believes. I beg you, Paul says, don't do that. Live your life in a way that is consistent with your identity. If you're gonna identify as a follower of Christ, then live, you won't do it perfectly, but live as a follower of Christ would live. And beg, implore, the word I would use, I think maybe the best translation would be <clears throat> summon. I summon you. Because really this word is used um, as legal language. And it's this idea of being compelled or um, forced into court to give evidence of something. So think of the word summon as, as being compelled to come in and offer up evidence that will stand up in court. You've been summoned, that's what's happening here. Paul is saying, I summon you to live a life that provides compelling evidence for your identity. Live your life in such a way that if your identity is ever in question, people could take the evidence of how you live, how you love, how you talk, how you give, they could take that evidence and say, this is who that person is. The way they live is proof of their identity. You wanna know who they are, look at how they live. And so the question then becomes, does my life give evidence to my identity? Does the way I live identify myself as a follower of Jesus? There should be evidence that would be compelling in court to say, oh, this person is in Christ. I can tell by the way he or she lives. Um, it's probably too soon in the sermon for another funeral story. But, but this one's a fun one. And I think we can all agree there's not enough fun funeral stories. So this took place in 2006. Uh, Bob Russell had just retired as senior pastor of Southeast Christian Church. Been here for a long time and was a bit of a legend, is a bit of a legend around here, but also among preachers and pastors around the country, really, um, for many things. But one of those things was his sheer consistency. 
Like he just never struck out. Every time he got up, there was something compelling. And, and uh, that was 2006. That same year, not long after he retired, Matt Reagan came on staff as a new pastor. And, and he had never seen Bob or met Bob. Now, certainly he had heard Bob preach on the radio or maybe cassette or CD, you know, but this was before the days of being able to just hop online and watch somebody preach. So he didn't, he didn't know what he looked like. He'd never met him in person. It's brand new as a pastor. Like the first week he's here, there's a, uh, a funeral of a longtime member and Matt decided that he was gonna go to this funeral. He went with one of our other pastors and he sat down for the funeral and he didn't know Bob was the one giving the message. Like you don't get introduced when you speak at a funeral. So he didn't know that that was Bob that got up to give the sermon during the funeral. And so he's sitting there watching like three, four minutes into it. Matt's like, this guy's really good. Like. <laughs> Now the bar must be pretty high around here. Like halfway through, he, he starts taking notes. You, you don't see that at a funeral. Like if you look around a funeral during the sermon and people are taking notes, it's a good sermon, right? Like you don't usually take notes during a funeral. But he's like, I'm, I'm gonna use that. That's worth writing down. Three-fourths of the way into it, if you hear Matt tell the story, he's ready to rededicate his life. Like if there's an invitation, he's going forward. And finally, he says to the guy that he came with, the pastor he came with, he's like, Man, who, is, who is this guy? He's preaching the sermon of his life and it's a funeral. And the guy's like, oh, this is who that is. And Matt's like, oh, that's who that is right? Like there was something distinctive about him that made Matt think, who is this guy? And the minute it's revealed, of course, that's this guy, right? There's something about it. And, and the Bible would teach that the way we live should be evidence of who we are in Christ. There's something about your life that's distinctive enough that even if people don't know your identity, they want to know who is this person, who talks this way, who loves this way, who gives this way, who is it? Oh, that's who that is. That your life is evidence of your identity. And so Paul is gonna give some practical instructions about that in chapter four, verse two. And some of these instructions are kind of uncomfortable. So Ephesians four, two, always be humble and gentle. What word do you think I would have the most problem with here. This one, always, always. Like, can't we just say be humble and gentle? Then it feels like general wisdom and we can all agree. Well, generally speaking, that's true. We should be humble and gentle. But the minute you put always in front of it, it gets a little bit more difficult because I don't mind being humble and gentle with some people some of the time. Right? Like, I don't mind being humble and gentle with some of y'all, but I don't want to be humble and gentle with all y'all. Like, that, always humble and gentle? That's a, like, always. When I'm driving and they're on the freeway, somebody pulls out in front of me, like, then? During a, a uh, election year? Then? Always be humble and gentle? Like, all, always? Really? It's the always that makes this so difficult. Always, it, does your life have that kind of evidence? Let's say that somebody collected all of your comments on social media and they presented it to the court. Would the court then determine that this is a person of humility and gentleness? They must be a follower of Jesus. If, if there was a recording of your tone, like you couldn't make out the words, all they could hear is your tone, just tone. What would your tone say about your humility and your your gentleness, always be humble and gentle. Now, some of you are like, I, look, I, I want to be that way. I want to always be humble and gentle. But the challenge here is that I'm, I'm almost always right. Like, I, I, I want to be humble and gentle, but I'm pretty much right all the time. And it's really difficult. If I were wrong a lot of the time, I would be humble and gentle, but I'm not usually wrong. I'm usually right. And it's hard to be humble and gentle when you're right. So, so here's the question to, to really wrestle with. As a Christian, what's the most compelling evidence of your identity? Is it that you're right or is it that you're gentle? You say, I'm right. Okay, are you righteous? It, it's not just about having a compelling argument. It's, it's the tone. Are you gentle and are you humble? Well, what if the most compelling evidence that you're a follower of Jesus isn't necessarily what you say, but it's how you say it? What if that's what people notice? 
It strikes me that we live in a time where this is so rare, but it gives us opportunity to present some pretty compelling evidence to the world, right? Like the difficult people that are in your life, the, the tense circumstances that surround us provide for us an opportunity to do things differently, to speak about things differently with, with gentleness and with humility, that there's an opportunity there for us to offer up evidence that our identity is different because of the fact that we are in Christ. Do everything with humility, with, with gentleness. So what if, what if that's the most compelling evidence? So let me just say this, and I'll say it with gentleness. If you're speaking the truth of Christ, but you're not doing it in the spirit of Christ, then you should, you should sit down and be quiet. Like if what you're saying is true, but it's not spoken with gentleness and humility, then let somebody else say it. You, you don't need to say it. It's, it's not just about being right, it's about being humble. It's about being gentle. Sometimes I'll have... Uh, people in the church tell me a certain sin that they think I should be preaching about and a certain tone I should have in preaching it. How you need to get mad about this sin. And whenever someone kind of starts telling me, hey, here's the sin you should be preaching about. Why aren't you preaching about this? I have this go-to response. I will say, I didn't know you were struggling with that. Because it seems that people rarely often want you to talk about the sin they're struggling with, but they often want you to talk about the sin that other people struggle with. And and that tone and that attitude in the church is not evidence of being in Christ. And so Paul says, look, you, you should do everything, always be humble, always be gentle. Then he says in verse to be patient with each other, making allowance for one another's differences because of your love. The evidence of patience is that you have space for other people in your life to not agree with you. That you have space to have a relationship with somebody and not see things the same way that they see things. Like, that's okay. The the idea here is that you can accept someone without necessarily having to agree with them, necessarily having to affirm them. Now, they may not accept that acceptance from you, but that's on them. You, you can accept someone without always having to agree, always having to affirm. Like you can make room for there to be some differences. That's part of patience. And so what if the most compelling evidence that you're in Christ isn't that you're preachy with people, but that you're patient with people? Uh, you jump down to verse 17. Paul's gonna specifically talk to us about what needs to happen uh, in order for us to uh, flip that switch, to live differently, to live in alignment with our identity. Um, typically when we think about change that needs to take place, like most of us would say, well, okay, yeah, I, I wanna be more gentle. I wanna be more humble. I wanna be more patient. I wanna be more holy. Like, okay. The way we approach that typically is by behavior modification. All right, I'm gonna, through self-determination, make this change and this change and this change. But Paul's gonna make the argument that transformation comes through um, our thinking, It's not so much behavior modification, it's more thought transformation. The Bible says that we're made new in our minds. We're made new by the renewing of our minds. That that's the the switch that needs to get flipped. And I think for many, many of us, the frustration that we experience in our faith is that we wanna make some certain change over here to more align with who we are in Christ. But the way we've been taught to do that is through just more effort. Just try harder. And then the weapons that usually get used are guilt and shame. So I'm gonna use guilt and shame to try to get you to try harder and it just doesn't seem to work. There's a different switch that needs to get flipped. Um, A few years ago, we had a handyman come to the house to hang a light fixture in the kitchen. And I, you know, I didn't know how to do it and and so we hired this guy to come in and do it and, and he came in, hooked everything up, got it set up and then flipped on the switch and nothing happened, there was no light. 
It's like, that's weird. And he undid everything and he rehooked everything up, flipped on the switch. Again, no light. My wife's watching this and she's a little frustrated because she's thinking maybe she bought a fixture that was you know, bad, didn't work. I'm watching all of this a little delighted, frankly, that he's having so much trouble with something that I didn't know how to do. And, and, and yet I also feel like I know what the problem is. And I've never hung a light fixture before, but I feel like I know what he's doing wrong, that he's flipping the wrong switch. Because our electrician, whoever he or she might be, um, was not blessed with the gift of intuition because there's, there's all kinds of things in the house that are not intuitive as far as this switch goes with this light. It's like you walk in the front door, you flip on a switch and it controls the upstairs bathroom. It makes no sense, a lot of it. And so I'm watching this thing. He's just flipping the wrong switch, but I'm reluctant to say something because I'm not a handyman. If I was a handyman, I, I wouldn't have hired him to do it, right? I'm reluctant to say something because my solution seems too simple. And he's putting in all kinds of work. It's rewiring things and taking things down and putting things up. And, and so I'm just saying, switch a different, flip a different switch. And that just feels like, uh, sounds too simple. So I wait for the third time. He finally gets it hooked back up. And I walk over and I flip on the switch that I think it is. And the light comes on. And I don't wanna take all the credit for hanging that light fixture, but it wouldn't have happened if I hadn't flipped that switch, right? Like it, it mattered. You can do a lot of things, but if you don't flip the right switch, then it doesn't, it doesn't work. And I would say that, that for many of us, we've tried these different switches. We've tried like, you know, self-help switch and it works for a little while and then it doesn't. And we've tried guilt switch and shame switch and it works for a little while and then it doesn't. But the Bible would teach that we are transformed by surrendering our thoughts to the Holy Spirit, by being intentional about what we think about. The Bible says that as you think in your heart, so are you, that's who you are. That our identity in Christ comes through Christ, but we grow in that identity through how we think, what, what we think about. And so Paul's gonna talk to us about our thinking specifically, and he compares and contrasts the thinking of those outside of Christ with those in Christ, verse 17. So I tell you this, and I insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. In the futility of their thinking, he says, I insist on this. You don't live the way that people outside of Christ live. You don't do that. I, it's not just a recommendation. It's not just like a helpful hint. It's not just a suggestion where you come to church and you say, I wanna be a part of this church community. I wanna be in Christ, but I wanna keep living the way I've always lived. No, I, in, I insist on that not being the case. You, you, you don't say that you're a follower of Jesus and then just continue to live the way that everybody lives who are outside of Jesus. And, and so he says, I insist on this, that you no longer live as the Gentiles do. And then he uses this phrase that I really want us to focus on here is the futility of their thinking. Futility of their thinking. Uh, let me give you a word picture to help with it. Okay, let's say that you are sitting on your couch at home and you wanna watch something on TV. So you start flipping through the channels and that's, you've got hundreds of channels and you're just flipping through and flipping through and finding something to watch. Lots of things to th think about. But you flip through the channels and you say to yourself, there's what? There's nothing on, nothing on. You got a smart TV though, so you go over to Netflix. And right now on Netflix, there's like 1,940 different options of shows for you to watch. And you start scrolling through Netflix and like anything that's worth watching, you feel like you've already watched, you scroll through it and, and, and you say to yourself, there's nothing on. Hundreds of channels, thousands of shows, and yet there's nothing on. This is the futility of thinking, where you're flipping through all kinds of channels, lots of information, lots of entertainment, and yet nothing, yet nothing that seems purposeful or meaningful. And, and that's the futility of thinking, that there's a lot of options, but nothing with meaning. So let me put it this way. Futility, futility of thinking is an emptiness that comes not because there is a lack of something, but because there's an excess of nothing. That's futility of thinking. 
It's, it's the thinking that comes not from a lack of something, but from an excess of nothing, right? And that describes the culture in which we live. We have all kinds of things to think about, all kinds of entertainment, all kinds of information, more access to that stuff than we've ever had, exponentially so. And yet, the real problem is the excess of nothing. It just, it just doesn't... Um, offer anything. I was watching this TED Talk called Screen Time, and on this uh, TED Talk, they were giving some different statistics about how our lives are more and more dominated by screens and, and what that means. And they made this connection that when I say it, we'll be like, well, of course, but it's not one that we stop and think about very often. They said, part of the challenge now is that the more external input you receive, the less internal reflection takes place. Does this make sense? The more external input that you have, the more things you have to think about, the more access you have, the more channels you receive, the more um, things you can flip through. The more external input you have, the less internal reflection happens. And so there's more and more to think about, but less and less Reflection. So when's the last time that you just stopped and you thought, do I like who I am? Like, who, who am I becoming? I mean, when's the last time you just laid awake in bed and you just thought about your day and the interactions you had? When you just thought about, was I humble and gentle today? Was I patient? When's the last time that you, you did that? Because I, I think for many of us, there's not a lot of internal reflection. We just constantly reach for a screen, more external input, lots to think about, but, but we, don't, we don't reflect. And, and so, so Paul talks about this, this futility of thinking and where it leads. And he, ta- he says specifically a couple of different things. Look at verse 18. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. And so he says this futility of thinking, this constant exposure to this external input, constantly things to entertain and inform, it it leads first to, strangely enough, darkened understanding. That the more information doesn't mean necessarily more understanding, sometimes it leads to blindness. Like the, the light becomes blinding, exposed to so much. And, and this explains why sometimes people miss the obvious. They don't see clearly what's right and what's wrong. We have a lot of that in our culture. A couple of weeks ago, um, an example of this, I had two different articles show up in my news feed. And one article was about a group of people that were upset around um, uh, wanting to protect abortion rights. So a law was passed in Texas, you may have seen this, um, that made abortion uh, illegal once there was a, a beating heart that can be detected, once it, when it goes from one heart to two hearts. And, and they were, there were people upset about that, like fighting for abortion rights. Then on the same news feed, there was another article of people who were upset because um, the eggs of sea turtles were being poached. And they just had a huge problem with the eggs of sea turtles being poached. And so you see this and you're like, wait, how, how does that happen? And some of you, if you went in for an ultrasound and you saw the image and you saw your baby and you're like, well, I see that. How does somebody not see that? It's dark and understanding. It's dark and understanding is like the teacher who comes to me and has this training time where she's told that she needs to talk to her middle school students about suicide because this is a growing area of concerns and issue we can't not talk about anymore. But she's told in that same conversation, don't listen, don't talk about God, don't bring God into this conversation. Don't say things like God loves you and cares for you, don't talk about God's plan for their life. So talk to them about suicide, but don't talk to them about God. It's dark and understanding. Dark and understanding, I think, is, is, the, is the feminist 
who celebrates the objectification of women in porn. Like, wait, wh what? How are you for that? It, it, darkened understanding, darkened understanding is the college in Boston that says to students, hey, you can't say, it's forbidden on campus to say God bless you because that could be a microaggression towards an atheist. A darkened understanding is this idea that we could, we're gonna somehow fight against racism by returning to segregation and, and exclusion. It's this like, wait, how, how can that work? And yet the more futile our thinking becomes, the more darkened our understanding seems to be. And Paul talks about this a little bit in Ephesians 4, 17 through 18. I love the way the message paraphrases this. I insist that there be no going along with the crowd, the empty-headed, mindless crowd. They've refused for so long to deal with God that they've lost touch not only with God, but with reality itself. They can't think straight anymore. Futility of thinking, also verse 18 talks about, uh, it leads to this hardened heart where it doesn't happen all at once, but the more and more external input we receive, the more callous we tend to become towards certain things, spiritual things. And certainly we see that. Verse 19 describes the condition of a callous heart. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. They just lost sensitivity. They've become numb spiritually, morally. In his book, Wired for Intimacy, psychologist William Struthers uh, talks about how our thinking um, leads to this place of, of numbness. And the book is specifically about pornography, but he, he talks about the, the different stages of thinking that lead to this hardening of a heart. It's my language, not his. And so I'm, I'm gonna go through these stages quickly. Again, he applies this to porn, but I think it could apply to a, a number of different areas where our thinking changes um, stage one is denial. It's someone who says, hey, I can look at this. It's not a problem for me. It won't affect my relationships. It won't affect the way I see um, sexuality. Stage two in thinking is minimization. This is where someone says, it's, it's not that big of a deal. Um, I can stop when I want. It's just some harmless fun. It's not a problem. Stage three, thinking is normalization. This is someone who determines that it's fine to think about what they think about because it's what everyone else is thinking about. And if they think about it, then I might as well think about it. it it's just, eh, if everybody else is doing this, then it must be fine. Stage four is rationalization in our thinking where your thoughts are constantly rationalizing what you've done. Well, it's not my fault because of the way I was raised or because of what's out there, because of the way people dress. It's not my fault because the internet makes everything so accessible. It's just, you start rationalizing what you've done and then you justify what you're gonna do. Stage four, that's the way your thoughts start to work. Then stage five is celebration. With enough ex repeated exposure, with enough futility of thinking around this, what was once a secret, you now celebrate. What was once something you were ashamed of, you now anticipate. What was once something you're, you were trying to stop is now something that you schedule. Like you put it on the calendar and you, you plan for it. And, and somewhere along the line, our thinking developed a hardness of heart. Then Paul talks about sw flipping that switch when you're a follower of Jesus, that there's something that changes in the way we think. Verse 22, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires and to be made new in the attitude of your minds in the way that you think, be made new in how you think and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And so he compares this, these two ways of thinking. Verse 17 is the futility of thinking. Verse 23 is this new way of thinking because of who you are, your identity in Christ. So here's my challenge for you as we wrap up. For this week, switch your thinking from output to input. There's a lot of different ways we could kind of uh, apply this, but this is just one simple thing I want you to focus on for this week is switch your thinking from output to input. In other words, our tendency is to think about change in terms of here's what I need to do differently, behavior, action. I'm saying for this week, just focus on input and see if that doesn't change the output. See if that doesn't change the output. See, I think for many of us, you say, well, I wanna be, I really want to be gentle. 
Okay, well, what's your input look like? Because look, if you wanna be gentle, but you can't get enough of a certain, I don't know, podcaster that's always angry and giving you a, a, a paranoid perspective, then good luck with that, right? You, you wanna be gentle, but if your constant input is, is to hear a voice of someone who says, hey, they're all against you, you're gonna have a hard time being gentle. You say, I wanna be humble, but what's your input? If your input is constant consumerism and you're constantly you know, watching uh, advertisements, you're scrolling through Amazon, shopping an hour, two hours a day online, thinking about what you don't have and how you're entitled to it and why can't you have what they have, then man, it's gonna be hard to, hard to be humble when you're focused on yourself like that. It's gonna be hard to be humble if you you kind of surround yourself with this echo chamber and all you hear are from other people who think what you think and believe what you believe and you become somewhere convinced, somehow convinced that everybody else is hearing and seeing these same things, but they're not. They're hearing and seeing their echo chamber of people who see things the way they do and believe what they believe and man, it's hard to be humble if that's what you're doing. You say, I wanna be holy. I wanna be holy. I wanna walk in purity. Well, what's your input? What, what do you, images are you putting in your mind? Now, you might shake your head in disgust at someone like Solomon who had a thousand wives. But, but some of you view more nudity in a week than Solomon saw in his entire life. You, you fill your head with more lustful images in a week than he had in his entire life. And that kind of input affects us, it matters. And so switch your input. What would it look like then this week if you said, I'm gonna begin every day and I'm just gonna write down a few things that I'm thankful for in my prayer time. Every day I, I'm gonna read the Bible. And so you sign up for one of our version plans through the uh, version Bible app and, and you just start reading through 10, 15 minutes a day, reading through some scripture. But what would it look like if on the way to work, or the way to class, you get on Spotify, you search for Awaken Worship, and you just listen and sing along to some of the worship music that we sing here on the weekend. What, what would it look like? And I know this is crazy, but if you just laid in bed with nothing to look at or do, you just laid there and you thought about things and conversations you had and the tone that you took. You, you thought about the way you live and the way you love and the way you give, and you, you really thought about that, some internal reflection, and what would that change? And so that's the challenge for you this week is to focus on input and see how that changes your output because these things are connected. We are transformed by the renewing of our minds. And so Paul challenges us to flip that switch of how we think. And I, I know for some of you, this is, this is hard. I mean, even while we've been talking, it's been hard because your mind is full of external input and you're thinking about the games on this afternoon. Maybe you're watching this at home and you're kind of listening, but you're also kind of in the kitchen working on lunch or you're playing a game on your phone and it's always got this futility of thinking in the back of our heads. Or, or maybe you've been listening to the sermon and you think, well, I, that, I mean, ideally that's great, but I can't change. I'm destined to fail. The Bible gives us a different truth to think about. 2 Corinthians 12, nine says, his grace is all I need and his power works best in my weakness. And maybe you're sitting there thinking, I, you know, I've tried, I've tried this and I, I've tried and it just always ends with defeat. Well, you stop thinking that way. The Bible says in Romans 8, 37, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And you've been thinking I'll always be the same. This is just the way I am. It's the way my parents were. It's the way their parents were. It's just been passed on to me. It's probably the way my kids are gonna be. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, the new has begun. Think about that. Maybe you've been thinking I'm too messed up and I could never make a difference and God doesn't have a plan for my life. He's gotta switch your thinking. Ephesians 2, verse 10, we are God's masterpiece. He created us new in Christ Jesus so we can do the things he planned for us long ago. It begins in your minds. Don't think about the output for a week. Just focus on the input. Focus on guarding your heart, guarding your mind, and seeing the difference that that brings in your life. God, I thank you that you have um, called us 
to live out our new identity in you. And, and I know there are parts of me that don't align with my identity as a follower of you, that you, you wanna bring to my attention some things that you, you want to more perfectly align with your will for my life. And it's hard for me to see those. My heart can become hard. My thinking can become futile. I can live with constant distraction. And so God, even as we talk about these things, I, I know in my mind, like this is 30, okay, maybe 35 minutes of a message. And, and then, you know, we're all gonna be swamped with lots of other input and content and information and entertainment. So I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would allow the truth that we've studied from scripture to take root deep within our hearts, that you would stand guard at the door of our hearts and our minds, that, that we wouldn't just welcome in any thought that comes. We didn't, wouldn't just flip through the channels and watch whatever's on, but that you would, you would guard our mind, you would guard our, our thoughts, that, that we would surrender each of those to you, that we would take every thought captive and make it obedient to you. We can't do that on our own. We need lots of help and we need lots of grace. So I pray that you would give it to us and that you would allow our lives to be evidence of who we are in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Um, so earlier in the message, I talked about how um, in baptism, it reflects what we've been talking about, right? That the old is gone, the new has come. It's a new identity that we celebrate and so we, we get to celebrate that most every week around here. I wanna specifically challenge some of you who have not taken off the old. You've put on the new, you've tried to put on the new without taking off the old and it just hasn't worked. Like you gotta take off the old before you put on the new and, and really that's what is captured in baptism. The old is gone, the new has come. And so if that's a decision that you need to make, if you wanna to talk to someone about putting your trust in Jesus, following him, receiving that identity. Um, then after our service, you can go to our next step room on our first floor to your left. If you're watching this online, you just text the word connect to 733-733. We'd love to reach out to you. Let's stand, let's worship our great God. Cause you bring things to life 
my whole life down for you I lift my hands up and lay my whole life down my whole life now is for you you sing it and I lift my hands up and lay my whole life down oh we lift them up to you Lord we surrender Come on, church, can we shout it out? Come on. Yes, I lift my hands up, lay my whole life down, my whole life down before you. Yes, I lift my hands up, lay my whole life down, my whole life down before you. Yeah. And all praise to the Lord, Lord. Sing it out, church. And Southeast, what a great weekend. Thank you so much for being a part of Southeast Online. What a great way to end it with baptisms there. And what a great service as we start a brand new series, Flip the Switch. Yeah, so if you still need to talk to somebody, you want to pray with someone, will you text the word CONNECT to 733-733? Absolutely. Yeah. We really do look forward to following up with you, so make sure you send that CONNECT text in. Uh, you know, we weren't the only ones watching service. We have all yeah. these wonderful people joining us, yes. and maybe you at home were able to channel in. So we asked the question in the chat. We said, uh, what is the thing in your life, what is it that in this message has made you really feel this is what I need to flip the switch on. And we heard from some people. Yeah, so Diana on Facebook said, more of a balance in life. I can let work consume me. Oh, wow, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, yeah, that's a, that comes in the mind first is to yeah. when to turn off work and turn on home. Yeah. Uh, Wendy wrote this uh, in answer to that question. This is what Wendy said on Facebook. She writes in, my thinking process, be humble. I need to flip the switch on that. And I agree with that, Wendy. Uh, and I think as I was taking in the message, that's exactly what I was thinking about. So how, how much of it begins with our thinking. Sarah, what connected with you? What yeah. were you thinking about? Um, there was a part where Kyle talked about Romans 12, 2, mm -hmm. about being transformed transformed by the renewing of our minds yeah. and how really the Holy Spirit transforms us when we are renewing our minds in his word, in community, in his presence, yeah. and all of those things. Just That's so important. Yeah, it is. It, it begins with how you're thinking first and how you begin yeah. to process it, and that's when it flows to action. One of the things yeah. I really connected with was how Kyle was talking about Ephesians chapter 4 is this turning point. I love that Ill analogy because the first three chapters are all about who you are and talking about your child of God, who you are, and then from that it flows to how you believe. And so uh, we have to first get our thinking right, and then yeah. now we're moving into the behavior side, like how, yeah. how then do we act, how then do we behave, how do we interact. You know, I love getting to be able to talk about this. Yeah. Um, I think interacting with the God's Word and with a message is best in a group. You were a group leader yes, for us. I was. All right, so tell us a little bit. We've got groups launching in the chat 
unique link that will take you to the SE Online groups. You can text the word groups to 733-733 as well. But we've got brand, you know, groups getting ready to roll out. Yes. You should sign up if you haven't. Sarah, tell yes. us though, hopping in Zoom for your first, leading an online group yes. for your first time. I know you had to be maybe a little skeptical of Zoom. Yeah. Tell us, what was your experience yeah. with leading an so online group? So when I started um, leading that group, it was in the middle of lockdown yep. and doing everything on Zoom. So I was a little worried, but it ended up being incredible. The screen yeah. was not a hindrance. It was such a gift to be able to connect with Alice and Jane and Kathy. And we were all spread out. No mm -hmm. one was in the same city yeah. or even the same country. So, well, two of us was in the three <laughs> of us. But anyway, we were spread out. And so being able to connect and talk about the sermon, the word with someone on the other side of you know, the ocean was so special. Well, yeah. and that's one of the things I think when you when you get to connect with people, guys, and you're getting to see them yeah. and they get to see you every single week, there's great power in that community. If you've yeah. never experienced that, it's not real complicated. We take the weekend's message and listening to what you just heard today, mm -hmm. and then now you get the power of community to surround you. Yeah. And it's such, a, I think, a great way to do that and to sign up for a group. What's the thing you found uh, most surprising about the actual experience compared to what you were thinking about before you did the group? Oh, um, just how connected, how quickly Yep. all of us connected. Um, to even when we met in person, mm -hmm. it was sweet. There was no weirdness. It was just nice to be with my friends. So it was as easy as like being face to face. And that's one of my favorite things. Actually, that group that was on the, if you watch the very beginning of this video of a group, a lot of yeah. them are coming to homecoming, which is oh, in like three weeks. Yes. And one of my favorite things when groups get together for the first time uh -huh. is they all talk about how um, it surprised them how easily they got to know each other yeah. because of the online experience. So it's real That's and so homecomings cool. in three weeks. Yes. And so we have a group traveling in. We have several groups actually nice. coming together. They're all going to be together. Uh, October 8, 9, and 10, it's where homecomings where we're inviting our SE Online family, wherever you're located, yeah. to come to the Blanket Baker campus, to come to Louisville, Kentucky, and get yeah. to be here all weekend. we got activities planned the whole weekend. Yep. It's going to be a super thing. What are you excited about the oh. most about? Probably worship. Yeah. And we're all going to worship together. Saturday night, campfire yeah, Saturday worship. Saturday night, campfire worship. Just to all be together yep. worshiping, because I know we worship from our wherever we are. Yeah. But to be in the same place together, I am so excited. Yeah, it's I so think special. it's going to be a special weekend. So if you've not signed up yet, this is your moment. You need to sign up for homecoming right yeah. now, okay? Uh, we've got so much planning happening in three weeks, and we could be more thrilled to get to connect and worship uh, with you. Sarah, thank you so much yes, for being a part you. of SE Online. And so you at home, thank you for being a part of this community yeah. is more than just this video. We actually have a Facebook page that's all about connecting us together. Go look it up, Southeast Online Community. You search it, like it, follow us, because this is more than just a once a week thing. This is an everyday thing. Sign up for groups, sign up for homecoming, and we look forward to worshiping with you next week. Bye, everybody. Hi, I'm Ian. I'm Sharon. I'm Val. I'm Bush. I'm Sherry. I'm Tom. And we're from Wisconsin, and we're going to
Hi, we're Matt and Carrie Tucker, and we lead an SE online group from Decatur, Illinois. Together in our group, we have people from all over the country. We love our SE online community. If you're not in a group, join a group today. You get to make new friends, be a part of a great community, and study the Word of God with people from everywhere. So y'all don't miss your opportunity to join an online group today. Hi, we're Matt and Carrie Tucker, and we lead an SE online group from Decatur, Illinois. Together in our group, we have people from all over the country. We love our SE online community. If you're not in a group, join a group today. You get to make new friends, be a part of a great community, and study the Word of God with people from everywhere. So y'all don't miss your opportunity to join an online group today.